Hello, everybody. Terrence Lake, you here with another episode of the Intellectual Agrarian Podcast, where we talk philosophy from the farm. Today's guest is Laura Dunn, director of Look and See, a portrait of Wendell Berry. Today's episode, we'll be looking at what makes Look and See different than typical documentary biopics, how creativity can come from the challenges we face in our productions, and what led Laura to make this film, and so much more. Let's get into this episode with Laura Dunn. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you. Before we get too far down the road, can you give the audience a brief biographical sketch? Sure. I've been doing documentary filmmaking since I was about 19, so a little over 20 years now. Um, I live in Austin, Texas. I'm a mom to six young boys. Um, my husband, Jeff, and I make documentaries together, and our latest effort is a portrait of Wendell Berry. And I think that he's really um, been an influence on my film work for a while because um, the other feature film I did 10 years ago um, features a, a poem by Wendell Berry. And that looks at water and development issues in Austin, Texas. So my film work started in uh, at Yale University um, where I documented a labor strike on campus and made a short film about the corporatization of higher education. And then I came to graduate school at UT Austin and worked on a film about environmental racism along the Mississippi River Petrochemical Corridor, um, did some other experimental films about ecology and energy and population issues. So my work's always been influenced by questions around our relationship with the natural world and um, also social justice, economic justice issues. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have some wonderful and amazing mentors like Terrence Mallet here in Austin. Um, and let's see, I'm born in New Orleans, grew up just kind of moving all over the place, and uh, landed in Texas. God's country. Now, look, yeah. I said God's country, just a little joke. I have some yeah, friends that well, live in Texas, and they go, I find <laughs> Texans can go on and on about Texas, especially when they talk about how nice and warm it is. And they always had the misfortune of saying that to a Wisconsinite during winter when I sit there and go, yes, yes, thank you. I'm freezing in my britches. <laughs> yeah, it's warm. <laughs> now, look and see your latest documentary, A Portrait of Wendell Berry. It's a little different than the average documentary or biopic. Can you explain a little bit mm -hmm. about it without giving too much away? Yeah, I mean, I think... You know, my influences in documentary, I'm not someone who watches a lot of movies or TV um, really at all, honestly. I probably should watch more than I do just to inform the craft. But, um, you know, when you say the typical documentary or biopic, honestly, in some ways, I'm not sure what that is. And that may be why my films are a little bit different, is that they really are more influenced by uh, the classic documentary um documentarians like Frederick Wiseman or the Basil Brothers, really a more verite approach to the story. In other words, um, what I try to do is go into a story in a space without a lot of preconceptions of what that film's going to look like. It's more, I've been reading Wendell Berry for many, many years and love and respect his work and kind of have a sense of him, a very impressionistic kind of sense of the film I want to make and certainly a sense of what that message should be. But it really is an intention to reflect the space and reflect the man and reflect his place. And so I think I think because of that, it doesn't have that heavy-handed narrative structure that a lot of films you see today have, where I think the documentarian has an agenda and they go find a story and they break it down into what I think are oversimplistic kind of narrative structure and have a, narr a narration, and they kind of tell you the story the whole way through. I'm more interested in um, creating a space that the viewer can inhabit and discover, and it's an alternative to the space we're in, you know? I think that Wendell Berry reflects a world apart from the fast-paced, highly technological world that we're in, and uh, it's a kind of respite and a refuge from that. So I was trying to make a film that reflected that, that um, could bring a viewer into 
a different kind of taste, a different kind of uh, way of seeing. And that's what Wendell Berry's literature does for me. So it's a lot like instead of telling someone the story, it's showing them the picture and giving them an opportunity to hear the story through the picture. Would that be yeah, accurate? Yeah, I think there's many. Yeah, I mean, I think here's the thing is, I think I love nonfiction as a medium because it is infinitely complex. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you can't ever get your mind fully around it. There's no, I believe that there is a truth with the capital T. I'm not a postmodernist relevant, relativist in my worldview, but I also believe that none of us can ever fully see the truth and the reality. So there's always mystery. There's always layers of complexity. And I think that what I'm trying to do is create a space that's honest and true, a reflection of a place or a man. And in that way, there's no easy, quick summary. Mm -hmm. There's no um, simple picture, you know, there's images, there's story, there's multiple layers of storylines and perspectives. Now, I don't want it to just be a chaotic, unorganized mess. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like that. But I think it's more poetic, at least in its intention. Where a poem is can evoke many different kinds of images in one's mind, right? It can be a yes. single poem, but it's not necessarily forcing you, the reader, to experience a specific interpretation of that poem. It's opening up your mind to imagine and relate to the material in whatever way you personally do. That's a beautiful so that's way to put it. <laughs> less, try to be less didactic, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And more poetic. Very much so. Yeah. I think that the world can benefit a lot from that perspective. I hope so. Now, in making this movie, were there any specific challenges to the production? Yeah, yeah. I mean, with any documentary, you know, I think that I meet a lot of people who say that one of them is only a person. I always say, like, you have to really love it because um, unless you're someone like an Alex Gibney or someone who just has a lot of resources behind you, you know, it is a labor of love. It is the art of endurance. So I think almost everything about the production of a documentary is challenging. <laughs> you, you raise, you know, a few thousand dollars from friends and colleagues and you go with um, a bare bones crew and you shoot for three days and you don't know what you're going to have and you come home and you edit it um, and you then use that to try to raise money. You get some money, you go shoot again, you come home, you edit, you're trying to shoot, you know, all four seasons. You're trying to shoot farmers who are chasing the weather and the weather can shift on a moment's notice. Mm-hmm. You know, you're trying to film a man who doesn't want to be filmed and has very little regard for the medium. And meanwhile, you know, we have a couple of babies along the way. I mean, it's immensely challenging. <laughs> and um, I think you do it because it's hard. You mm-hmm. know? I think sometimes, sometimes you do things because they're hard. And I think that um, for me personally, I think the most challenging thing is the juggling act of trying to make movies and have kids and be present in both worlds. So that, you know, I edit most of the film at night when the kids are sleeping, that kind of thing. Um, I think in terms of the art of this film, I think most people would say, well, the challenge would be that you're trying to do a portrait of a man who doesn't want to be on camera. And I think that was kind of what a lot of people continue to sort of say, you know, that's the, that's the, the challenge of this film. And to me, I never really saw that as too big of a challenge. I saw it more as an opportunity. I think that, you know, the constraints in what you're doing or where all the possibilities are. I've always thought that was documentary. So when Wendell said to me he didn't want to be on camera, I thought, well, that's really interesting. Why? And he thinks that film degrades the imagination. And I agree with him, you know. Mm -hmm. So he also said to me that um, he is nothing but for his place and the people around him. And he doesn't want to be made an idol of or put on a pedestal. So I immediately thought, well, this is a portrait of a man, but it's it's really he is his place and he is the people he loves. And so it can be a picture that's seen through his eyes, you know, and that in, in many ways that's more true to who he is than if I were to stick a camera on his face, you know, mm-hmm. so boring. So I always thought it was an interesting possibility, but of course, it's more of a challenge in the marketing and distribution maybe than it is in the actual art of making it. So. 
That's a fascinating way to look at it. Uh, challenges are always opportunities of doing something different and innovating, and you certainly were able to do that with this film. Yeah, constraints is the word I think of. Like, we all have constraints, and mm -hmm. um, I really think the constraints are always the most fascinating moment in a, in a film. I, I, the unforeseen the, the film I made before this, and really the best character in the whole film, in my opinion, is this lobbyist who is the lobbyist for all the real estate developers, and he really is the one who is, um, he's kind of the puppet master. You know, he's the one orchestrating everything. He's behind the scenes, and I got him to tell me his story, but he only wanted to do it on audio. And then later, he didn't want to go on camera. And so later, um, he allowed me to film him building a model airplane, a military aircraft, like a Vietnam fighter jet, because that was his hobby. And so I filmed him with his hands building this model airplane, and I kind of put, he weaved throughout his tail, and, and it, it's so much more powerful than when you're just able to see his face. You know, you're so much more depth of you. So I, I just always think that's, that's where the, form, the art form becomes really interesting when you have constraints. That's absolutely fascinating. Now, what was your first introduction to Wendell Berry then? You know, people are asking that, and I honestly don't remember. I mean, he, he's just a writer that I've known about since I was in high school. So my mom is a native geneticist. She's been searching for the origin of corn and does... Um, sort of organic, non-GMO hybrids of corn. And so I grew up in, you know, university greenhouses and experimental cornfields and <laughs> with a very clear mandate to, um, you know, be sensitive to agriculture and sustainable agriculture. So somewhere in there, you know, I read Wendell Berry. I think I first read his poetry, maybe. Um, I haven't read much of his fiction, if any, until I started working on this film. I had read his nonfiction <coughs> essays and uh, The Unsettled America. What a beautiful and important book. And I don't know, maybe my mom gave that to me. I don't even remember. <laughs> so it's really more of a, a writer I've, I've known since I can remember. So how did you become involved in Look and See? Well, it was my idea. Um, I was working on The Unforeseen, the last film. I was working with Terrence Malick on it, and uh, it's pretty much a local story about um, Austin, a, a spring-fed pool here in Austin. It was under threat from real estate development. And um, when we were editing that, Terry encouraged me to look for some writers who could contextualize that story within a larger frame. And one of those writers he asked me to look at was Wendell Berry. So I took another look at his work, and I found a poem I really loved. And I wrote to Wendell and asked if he would read the poem and let me use the poem in the film. And that's when I went to meet with him. That was back in 2004. Yeah. And um, that's when I first met him. And when I toured that film, I had a poem of his and his voice reading it woven throughout that film. And when I toured that film to film festivals all over the world, um, I was really surprised at how few people knew of Wendell Berry. I just very, very surprised by that. So I just wanted to do what I could to draw more attention to his work. And uh, Robert Redford was one of our producers on The Unforeseen, and I brought the idea to him. He was very influenced by The Unsolved in America back in the 1970s when it first came out. So he was eager to support the project, as was Terry Malick. So, um, you know, I kind of, the whole, the whole project was, was my idea, so it's kind of how I got involved in it. So I started it. Mm -hmm. So, did this film change any of your viewpoints on agriculture? Did you see anything different that you hadn't expected to find? Yeah, I mean, I think that... I think a few things. I mean, I think one of the things that jumped to mind is it's easy to, especially from an academic place, you know, my family, my grandparents, great-grandparents, they were pecan growers in South Mississippi, like there's some agriculture and horticulture in our family, but I didn't grow up on a farm, and my mom was an academic, she wasn't a farmer, and I think it's really easy from 
we have removed from our culture to be judgmental uh, about the different practices. And if you sort of say, well, you know, we have a kind of self-righteous lens on what kind of agriculture is good and what kind is bad, and imagining that the people who are doing large-scale industrial agriculture are horrible, greedy people, you know. And, of course, when you go and actually meet the farmers, you then can get caught up in the challenges they face. The economic forces are so intense. So you have these large-scale farmers who are generational family farmers, who work with their dad all day, every day, who are working the farms that they grew up on, but just don't see any other economic um, possibility for sustaining the farm other than to lease five different farms and then farm in 2,000 acres. And you have to lease the big equipment and you take more debt and then corn prices go down. You take more debt. You know, it's this um, very difficult challenge. So I think humanizing um, that world and seeing these are real people um, and that it's not as simple and easy and black and white and good and bad as one might think I think is a big message that I want people to come away with. Mm-hmm. I think the other thing is just the disconnect between this, you know, it's so easy to go to your Whole Foods or your farmer's market and think that, you know, local organic farmers are thriving when they're not. You know, the amount, the demand for local uh, organic agriculture is going up, 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 up. But as it goes out, the actual number of producers who can survive is going down, down, down. So there's this huge disconnect in terms of just cultural values and economic realities. And I think the very are particularly good at pointing that out. So we talked about a little bit earlier, but how did Wendell Berry feel first about this film when you brought it up to him? No, it was kind of a yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> uh, so it wasn't like absolutely no, no. You know, it was kind of, uh, yeah, okay. And then, no, absolutely not. You know, <laughs> so it was a back and forth. And at some point, I just kind of gave up and didn't want to press it. And Tanya is the one who um, invited me back and wanted me to come do it and helped me. And he didn't, I didn't really interact with him too much about the film. You know, whenever I'd go to Kentucky to shoot, and we would schedule some time, and I would go visit with him and do audio interviews. And he was so gracious with that. And, um, and you know, every now and then I would tell him some kind of interview I did, or I would talk about some photos I found, and he seemed interested. But I didn't bother him with it much, you know. He knew I was doing it, and but Tanya was more the person who was involved, and of course her daughter Mary was very helpful. It's so exciting to see his children continue his work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, Definitely, and his grandchildren now too, yeah. Isn't that the idea? Multi-generational farming. It's a beautiful thing yeah, to see. Yeah, it is. It is. Now, Laura, are there any questions I haven't asked you that you wish I had asked? Um, I can't think of anything. All right. Top of my head. Where can people learn more about Look and See and your other work? Um, so we have a website, lookandseefilm.com, and you can find all about that. We are doing um, a lot of community screenings. We've done over 80, I think, it's a lot of farms and small communities across the country. So that's super neat to me. It's really kind of a realization of the idea. And, you know, I, I encourage if anyone wants to host a screening, I think, you know, you can watch it on DVD. We're, we're, um, Jeff, my husband, designed the packaging, and we're very much a mom-and-pop shop. So we're distributing our own DVDs and Blu-rays, and, you know, you can certainly do it that way, too. I think that it's neat, though, when you see the images of these farms and you hear the words of Wendell Berry and you meet all these other farmers, and you see those images and sounds projected on the side of an old barn, on the middle of a farm, you know. It just seems like it's the right context for letting Wendell inspire people and um, encourage people, celebrate farmers. So, you know, on our website, you can host screenings, you can order DVDs, you can find out if there's a screening near you. 
Um, and there'll be a link on there to our other films, twobirdsfilm.com is our website. Well, Laura, thank you so much for your time. I look forward to watching the film. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Big thanks to Laura for coming on the show. Be sure to be on the lookout for a showing of Look and See near you. Or order a copy from their website. I just got an email notifying me that my copy will be delivered by Christmas. Thank Laura for being on the show by ordering a copy and giving yourself an early Christmas gift. Tweet me your number one takeaway from the show. Uh, You can tweet me at at T underscore Lehew. If you enjoy the podcast, subscribe in whatever listening medium you use iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Overcast, Podbean, Castbox, any of them that you can really think of. I'm continually amazed at how many podcast apps there are these days. While you're there, leave us a review letting us know what you think. As always, I'm Terrence Lehew. This has been the Intellectual Agrarian Podcast reminding you to keep farming the dream. <laughs>